So as you all know, over the weekend, a white nationalist terrorist in Christchurch, New Zealand, went into two different mosques and murdered 50 people. And there were dozens more who were injured. Now, in his manifesto, which is 70 plus pages long, he credits individuals like Candace Owens for radicalizing him. And he says that Donald Trump is a symbol of renewed white identity. And it's horrific. It really speaks to just how problematic white nationalism and white supremacy has become, not just here at home, but around the globe. This is evidence that this is a huge, growing threat globally. And a lot of this discussion, you know, about this incident is how culpable are individuals like Candace Owens and Donald Trump. And I don't necessarily think anybody is contending that they are directly responsible, but can you say that they are indirectly responsible? Is that a reasonable conversation that we can have? Not only do I think it's reasonable, I think it's crucial. And I'm not necessarily wanting to focus so much on Candace Owens, more so than Donald Trump, who is a global leader. What he says especially holds weight. So this incident is incredibly heartbreaking, and my heart goes out to every single victim and their family because I couldn't imagine hearing that somebody I know or love went into a mosque where they theoretically should be the safest and was murdered by a white nationalist terrorist, I would be devastated. And I don't even know how I would be able to process that, process that level of cruelty. Now, it's not just the victims, because I know that Muslims around the world were really shaken by this, because that's the way that I felt as an LGBTQ American when I saw the Pulse nightclub shooting. It really shook me to my core. You know, when you're already dealing with marginalization and discrimination and you see someone open fire against your community specifically because of your identity, it does something to you psychologically that makes it difficult to process. You just kind of want to run away and hide. So I, my heart goes out to the families of the victims and the victims themselves, of course, and also Muslims around the world who are feeling this, who are feeling the ripples of this terrorist attack on their community specifically because it sucks. It's it's hard to get over. It's hard to process. And I was even debating talking about this because I usually don't talk about tragedies because I never feel as if I'm adding anything new to the conversation. I'm just trying to process it like everything else. And you can't, you can't fabricate words that will make people feel better in this situation. We all just feel shitty and it sucks. But I do think it's important to talk about this specifically because when it comes to the conversation of who is and isn't to blame, I think this is something we do need to grapple with and talk about, especially given that we have a president who traffics in hate non-stop. Now, what I do find admirable is that the Prime Minister of New Zealand actually is pledging to take action and pass gun reform, which is absolutely necessary. And that's certainly one element of the conversation in terms of taking action. But another element of the discussion is who can we blame? Can we blame Candace Owens, Donald Trump, or even PewDiePie since the shooter told people to subscribe to PewDiePie. Now, whenever this happens, you see people kind of lash out because, I mean, of course it's the case that Candace Owens never said, hey, you know, Muslims are a threat to you, then you should take action. Nobody's saying that she said that, but what we are discussing is who's part of the problem. And I do think that all of these people are part of the problem, and Donald Trump is specifically culpable because he's the president, because he has that bully pulpit, and he chooses to demonize Muslims, he has a Muslim ban, and individuals who are already marginalized, like immigrants. And what this does is this leads to violence. No, he's not saying Muslims are bad and they're a threat to you, therefore take action, but that's what these people who are psychopaths will logically deduce from his own rhetoric. It has violent consequences. Now, certainly, 
I do want to be careful about blaming politicians, and I want to emphasize that I'm not that I'm not saying that you know Donald Trump is directly culpable here because as a Bernie Sanders supporter, I was devastated when I learned that a Bernie supporter had opened fire at Republicans at a baseball event and he shot Representative Steve Scalise. And when the media and Republicans tried to pin that blame on Bernie, I defended him because Bernie Sanders would never encourage violence. He doesn't traffic in hate. However, in this situation, when it comes to Donald Trump repeatedly trying to tell us what a threat Muslims are and that we need a a shutdown on Muslims entering and exiting the country until we can figure out what's going on, repeatedly demonizing immigrants, I think that it is crucial to acknowledge that, yes, he is indirectly responsible here because this is what happens. If you constantly try to get people to think that a particular group of people and their identity specifically poses a threat to you directly, and it's not just that they're bad people, it's that they threaten you, well, what do you expect these people who are low-information voters are going to do? They're going to think, oh, well, Donald Trump is telling me Muslims are bad, and they pose a threat to me, so I'm justified if I want to harm them. That's what they think. That's what psychologically is happening here. So I do think it's important that we talk about how Donald Trump is indirectly responsible. I'm not saying he's directly responsible, but I think it's reasonable to say he's absolutely stoking the flames of hate and he's unquestionably part of the problem. And that is demonstrated when you look at his response to this, because he was asked if white supremacy is a threat and he downplayed it. Is it a white nationalist rising threat around the world? I don't really. I think it's a uh, small group of people that have very, very serious problems. I guess if you look at what happened in New Zealand, perhaps that's a case. I don't know enough about it yet. They're just learning about the person and the people involved. Uh, But it's certainly a terrible thing. Terrible thing. The killer in this tragic incident wrote a manifesto, apparently. Did you see that? Apparently, he I did not see it. I did not see it. But uh, I think it's a horrible event. It's a horrible thing. I saw it early in the morning when uh, I looked at what was happening in New Zealand. I just spoke, as you know, to the Prime Minister. I think it's a horrible, disgraceful thing and a horrible act. Okay? Thank you all very much. Thank you. So, make no mistake about it, he can't say that white nationalism is a rising threat because then he'd be inadvertently admitting that he is, in part, responsible for the rise of white nationalism. And he knows that what he's doing is problematic because in that same press conference, he used a white supremacist talking point to describe the situation that's happening at the border. And he admits it. Last month, more than 76,000 illegal migrants arrived at our border. We're on track for a million illegal aliens to rush our borders. People hate the word invasion, but that's what it is. It's an invasion of drugs and criminals and people. We have no idea who they are, but we capture them because border security is so good. But they're put in a very bad position and we're bursting at the seams, literally bursting at the seams. So he knows that the specific word invasion is a white supremacist talking point, but he used it anyway. And this was in the same press conference when he wouldn't acknowledge the threat of white supremacy. And it's because he's partially culpable in the rise of white supremacy. I'm not saying he catalyzed the rise of white supremacy, but he's certainly riding the wave and he wrote it right into the White House. So understand that you don't have to directly tell your supporters to harm these brown people who are invading our country. These aren't things that you have to directly say in order to incite hatred and violence against them. But if you are adding to this narrative that someone who is different than you is not only inferior to you, but they pose a threat to you personally, then you are in fact culpable, at least indirectly, when these shootings take place. And this is something the far right does openly now, very regularly. Candace Owens fear-mongered about France being a Muslim-majority country in 40 years. Jordan Peterson took a picture with someone who was wearing a shirt that said he was a proud Islamophobe, and he took this picture about a month before the shooting happened in New Zealand. The point is that if you traffic in hate on a regular basis and you are constantly fear-mongering 
about these communities with a very specific identity, then you don't have to tell them to incite violence. They're going to do that on their own because they're going to connect the dots based on what you told them. Now, what's particularly troubling about Donald Trump is that he doesn't just vilify constantly Muslims and immigrants, but he also has encouraged violence. And just this week, before, actually last week, before the shooting took place in New Zealand, he raised the specter of his supporters committing violence if they didn't get what they wanted politically. As Mary Poppenfuss explains, President Donald Trump warned in an interview that his supporters could, quote, play tough and make things very, very bad if they reach a certain point. He cited the police, military, and bikers for Trump as his backers. He didn't define what that certain point might be in the Breitbart interview published Tuesday, but the implication was that his supporters would stand for a limited amount of political decisions that they opposed until the tough people made things very, very bad. Violence by a military opposed to political decisions would be a coup. Quote, I have the support of the police, the support of the military, and the support of bikers for Trump, he said. Quote, I have the tough people, but they don't play it tough until they go to a certain point, and then it would be very bad, very bad. Now, we all need to understand that this rhetoric is extremely dangerous because he's technically inadvertently encouraging violence while still giving himself plausible deniability. What? I didn't say that my supporters should commit acts of violence. I'm just saying that maybe they will if we don't get the border wall I'm telling them we need in order to stop this invasion of brown people entering the country. And let's all remember that Donald Trump has directly incited violence before, back on the campaign trail. I certainly don't incite violence. Knock the crap out of them. I like to punch him in the face. I don't condone violence, and uh, I don't talk about violence. I would have done well, but I would have been boom, 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 I'll beat that. I don't know if I'll do the fighting myself or if other people will. Maybe he should have been roughed up because it was absolutely disgusting what he was doing. If you see somebody getting ready to throw a tomato, knock the crap out of them, would you? Seriously. I'd like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. Try not to hurt him. If you do, I'll defend you in court. Don't worry about it. In the good old days, this doesn't happen because they used to treat them very, very rough. And when they protested once, you know, they would not do it again so easily. We've become weak. we become weak. And you know what? The audience swung back. And I thought it was very, very appropriate. The audience hit back. And that's what we need a little bit more of now. Part of the problem and part of the reason it takes so long is nobody wants to hurt each other anymore, right? I don't know if I would have done well, but I would have been out there fighting, folks. I don't know if I would have done well, but I would have been boom, 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 I'll beat that. Do you plan on paying for the legal fees of this older gentleman in North Carolina who sucker punched the protester? From what I understand, he was sick, sticking a certain finger up in the air. And, 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 and that is a uh, terrible thing to do and in that, front of somebody that, frankly, wants to see America made great again. It's possible you could help him with legal fees if this man needs it. I've actually instructed my people to look into it, yes. So now that he's the president, he's since toned it down? But understand that he's doing two things, and he's trying to separate these things. On one hand, he is constantly vilifying communities who are already vulnerable in the United States. Muslims and immigrants. But he's also encouraging violence. Now, he's not saying you should do violence and punch these communities I'm fear-mongering about. But what you're essentially doing is laying the groundwork for these types of white supremacist terrorist attacks to take place. Now, are you directly responsible? No, because you didn't say go do violence, but you're just essentially putting it out there and allowing your supporters who are already predisposed to fascism and white nationalist talking points to take action and do something violent. That's what's being encouraged and Trump is unquestionably part of the problem. Now, another thing that I want to talk about is before the election. He was very popular among a specific crowd of people 
who overtly discriminate against marginalized communities, neo-Nazis. And in their own words in this next clip, they're going to explain why they supported Donald Trump in 2016. We have been seeing really ever since uh, Barack Obama first won election in late 2008, a growth in groups uh, on the radical right. In 2008, we went from about 150 uh, so-called patriot groups, anti-government uh, radical groups, uh, to something like 1,360 groups in 2012. In the last year, though, uh, Donald Trump has added fuel to that fire in a very big way. Al Gore and George Bush and people like and Mitt Romney and these people, they're all the same. You know, they're all the same type of candidates. So it's, it's pretty interesting this year to see something a little bit different. So. You know, we, we support those nationalist principles like closing the borders and things of that nature. So uh, we do support those things, but we're not going to come out and endorse them. Donald Trump wants to bring back jobs to America. Give dignity to the American worker. It's not that Trump is telling these groups what to think. Uh, they uh, have, you know, had their own white supremacist ideology for many decades now. What Trump is doing is legitimizing. I came here to speak on behalf of Donald Trump. I've never met the man, but I can tell that he has nothing but the best interest of this country at heart. So what Donald Trump does is he takes the feelings of hatred and fear that they already feel and he legitimizes them. When he says, really, it's the immigrants who are to blame for your economic woes and really it is Muslims who are to blame for your physical insecurity, he legitimizes their feelings of hatred and irrational feelings of fear. And this is exactly why white supremacy is on the rise. Because even if you aren't necessarily a white supremacist, well, if you're a Donald Trump supporter, then maybe you hear what he's saying and think, well, it's just common sense. But inadvertently, you're being primed to think in a white supremacist way. So his response to New Zealand was to condemn the massacre, but espouse the same white supremacist rhetoric during the same press conference that fans the flames of white supremacy. So what we see here is Donald Trump taking a disgusting stand, saying this is horrible, but then using rhetoric that he knows is white supremacist rhetoric. And I know that he was talking about an invasion of immigrants, but you've got to understand all of these marginalized communities that are targets for white nationalists, this all, it just, it just stokes the fans of hate and white supremacy. And Donald Trump should be absolutely ashamed of himself for what is obviously a detestable response. But getting back to the tragedy, my heart absolutely goes out to everyone who was affected by this, both directly and indirectly. And I think that as allies to these marginalized communities, we have to be doing more to make sure that they are safe and they feel protected at a time in a political climate where bigotry against them is not just rampant, but people are trying to find ways to justify it. That's really troubling. It's, it's horrifying. So to kind of wrap it all up, is Donald Trump and individuals on the far right directly responsible? No, and I don't think anyone who's serious is saying that. But they're indirectly guilty here. Because when you constantly fan the flames of hate and traffic and Islamophobia and bigotry and xenophobia then you can expect these types of things to happen. And even if this took place in New Zealand and Donald Trump is the U.S. president, you've got to understand that as a global leader, it's especially problematic. He's ha He has this responsibility that nobody else in the world has, and yet you see how irresponsible he's being with his bully pulpit. I don't know what the conclusion is other than we have to point this out and try to combat it, but certainly Donald Trump should be ashamed of himself, but we all know he has no shame. So um, it's just all around, it's sad. It's 
you know, my heart goes out to the, to, um, the victims. <laughs> 